briefly before we move on to another topic, uh, there is data that's being presented at this ASCO uh, on biosimilar of trastuzumab. Yeah. Um, I don't even know if you can call it trastuzumab. Are you allowed to call it, it is, biosimilar? Yeah. So it's biosimilar we'll anti HER2 therapy. I'm not sure what to call it. Is, it is biosimilar trastuzumab. trastuzumab. Okay. Yeah. So it is, <coughs> at the present time, the best way to describe it is a proposed biosimilar. So, um, so I'm discussing it, and oh, I've really? been reading a lot about biosimilars as a result. So there's really, um, it's, it's interesting, that the evaluation of biosimilars it, it really involves three big steps. One is a clinical quality attribute evaluation, that is, does this molecule actually look like the parent molecule, the reference molecule? And there are hundreds and hundreds of tests to be able to actually confirm that. The second is all the pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, the toxicology, and the third is an equivalence study. So what the group is presenting is equivalence data that shows that this is, at least with respect to response rate, equivalent to, in a double-blind, randomized phase three setting, to reference trastuzumab herceptin compound. So is that sufficient to be able to get a stamp of biosimilarity by a regulatory bodies remains to be seen because they have to assess the, uh, the quality attributes, they have to address the pharmacokinetics data, and then they have to take a look at the clinical equivalence. The challenge of biosimilars is the following. What is the label? Is the label just for metastatic first-line treatment as the study was conducted? or is it going to be for any indication for trastuzumab to date, including early stage, including gastric cancer as well? We don't know. Then the other challenge, of course, is going to be, what about combination with other therapies? Can we combine it with pertuzumab? Can we combine it with other chemotherapies? Because this trial was just based on taxings. But it was equivalent. This it was about. equivalent to, so Could you explain the trial just for our audience? Yeah, so the it. trial was just taxin plus trest, uh, herceptin versus taxin plus this compound, MYL compound. So, you know, can we then extrapolate that data? We don't know. So we are in, in a new And the territory. PFS was equivalent. It was about 12 and a half months, something like that. Well, the, the PFS at 24 weeks, they just gave um, the, the proportion of events that took place. They didn't okay. actually give a PFS value. Um, so we just have a proportion of events. Okay. So I think it's going to lead to a lot of discussions. There's no doubt that we need biosimilars. There's at least 11 other biosimilars being studied for Herceptin alone. And I have to use you know, the brand name in this case. And there's 11 other biosimilars that have been studied. And the, the data suggests that if we integrate biosimilars at the rates that we do need to, it's going to save the U.S. government $44 billion over the next 10 years. And it's the new generation of targeted therapies, immunotherapies that are coming That assumes, Sunil, that the biosimilars are going to be priced less. Do we really know that? So the data in Europe, where they have more biosimilars for erythropoietin agents, they have more biosimilars for, um, for Neupogen and GCSF, and they have um, uh, Remicade and Flectra uh, biosimilars, have shown that the rates of the product decreases by in the average range of anywhere between 20 to 40 percent. That's great. That's really that's so, really So I think there is definitely a role, but I think we will have to do a lot of decision making to say, how do we then, you know, um, take this data and put it into clinical practice and what's the rich indication.